X Town, uh, the, the Jackson Center, uh, for the invitation and for the uh, the wonderful hospitality that I've received here. Um, I'm thrilled to be here, um, and even my eight-year-old son Aaron um, was impressed, uh, at least initially. Um, when I told him that I was going to Jamestown, he said, "Wow, that's that's cool. Well, you get to go see the three ships." <laughs> and, and I thought, um, the three ships. Um, you know the ones we got to walk on on uh, summer vacation uh, a couple of years ago. Said, oh, right, that's James. That's uh, Jamestown Settlement, which is a different uh, Jamestown. And he said, uh, "Well, where's this Jamestown?" And I said, "What's well, in New York?" And he said, "Oh, you mean where the Yankees and the Mets and the Giants and the Jets and the Rangers <laughs> play?" And I said, "Well, same state, um, but different city." And uh, the Bills and the Sabers are nearby. To which he responded, "Oh." <laughs> um, <laughs> But uh, I want you to know that um, I am thrilled with the fact that, uh, that I'm here in, in time, especially with the efforts of the Jackson Center. I think that uh, even my uh, son will be impressed with the fact that I was here. Um, uh, let me commend you uh, on the creation of such a fine and important uh, institution. And I'm really impressed with uh, how much uh, Greg and, the, and the, uh, the individuals involved at the center have done in such a short period of time, as I mentioned to him. This is um, overdue. Jackson has not gotten the attention that he deserves. And um, it's a really important thing that you're engaged in. So if it's not uh, too inappropriate, uh, um, I hope people will join me in uh, giving Greg in the center a round of applause before I get started. <laughs> now, I'm especially pleased to have this opportunity because I believe that, uh, that Jackson is of much more than mere historical interest. Indeed, uh, I hope to demonstrate that Jackson's thought speaks and speaks powerfully to certain important contemporary political issues. And specifically, I will argue that Jackson's observations on executive power afford much food for thought in the post 9-11 age. I was inspired to think more carefully about Jackson after reading about claims to executive power that certain members of the Department of Justice made recently, uh, claims with which you are probably familiar. I have in mind uh, two claims in particular. First, I remind you uh, of a legal memorandum that became public this summer in which lawyers in the Office of Legal Counsel at the Department of Justice counseled that the President, uh, as Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, that he's not bound by domestic or international laws uh, prohibiting torture, uh, and that government agents who might uh, torture prisoners at, uh, at his direction uh, could not be prosecuted by the Justice Department. Uh, this advice was part of a classified report prepared for Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld after commanders at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, uh, complained in January of 2003 uh, that with conventional methods, they were not obtaining enough information from prisoners. Uh, and senior officers requested a rethinking of the whole approach to defending the country when we are faced with an enemy that does not follow international rules of warfare. Um, the report advised that necessity justified the disregard of law and the use of torture. Now, after this document, uh, which was not scheduled for declassification in two, until 2013, mind you, and after this document was reported in the Wall Street Journal, the White House disavowed the claim that the President has the authority to disregard the law. Uh, this claim, I would argue, is nevertheless deserving of a response in view of the fact that apparently there are persons in position of authority uh, who believe it. Now, the second claim of executive authority that I would like to examine is one that the White House did not renounce, namely the administration's claim which featured prominently in the three cases that the Supreme Court handed down in June, uh, that the executive does not violate an individual's Fifth Amendment right to due process when the president declares a person an enemy combatant, holds him indefinitely, and deprives him of access to an attorney or a trial. Uh, the administration made clear that it believed that no constitutional violation occurs, even if the person declared an enemy combatant is an American citizen, and even if a citizen is taken into custody on American soil. Now, as you know, in the two cases in which the court reached the merits, uh, the court ruled against the executive. 
And in the case involving an American citizen arrested on American soil, the court found the case to be improperly filed. But the expectation is that uh, um, once it works its way through the courts again, that the uh, court, uh, the judges will find against uh, the president in that case as well. Now, in the case is decided on the merits. Uh, certain justices referred, albeit briefly, to the opinions of Justice Jackson. And with regard to the aforementioned Justice Department memo on the president's power to disregard the law, certain scholars criticized the memo's authors for failing to discuss or even to cite the 1952 case, Youngstown Sheet and Tube Company versus Sawyer, in which Jackson wrote a celebrated uh, concurring opinion. Now, as I hope to demonstrate, these judicial and scholarly references to Jackson's contributions uh, to constitutional jurisprudence as it pertains to executive power were not misplaced. Now, I begin my analysis of these claims to executive power by consulting a speech that Jackson gave when he served as Attorney General of the United States, uh, three weeks after FDR nominated him to be an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court. Uh, the subject of the speech, which was broadcast on the radio, uh, was the Declaration of Independence. And this should not be too surprising uh, since he delivered it on the 4th of July in 1941. Now, Jackson began his speech by taking note of the ominous international situation, a situation that uh, should sound distressingly familiar to you. He observed that our nation, together with our sister republics on this hemisphere, faces a predominantly hostile and undemocratic world. For nearly two years, he added, Americans have been asking each other which way safety and security lie. Jackson noted that our options were limited because no amount of cautious behavior, no amount of polite talk will earn for us the friendship and goodwill of our enemies. Ultimately, he said, we must come to the day when we shall face their threats and their enmity for no other reason than that we persist in living the kind of life we live. Jackson urged his listeners to turn to the Declaration of Independence for the principles which should guide our action. Why? Because the document, he said, lays down a fighting faith in the rights of man, a faith to die by if need be, or, and this is what I would like to emphasize, even more bravely to live by. Uh, he reminded his listeners that the Declaration impresses upon all political power the high obligation of trusteeship. In so doing, it serves as the world's master indictment of oppression and is the nightmare of conquerors. Um, overridden countries find a bid to insurrection in the Declaration's assertions of the, uh, assertion of the right of people to alter or abolish an existing government that is destructive of life, liberty, and happiness. And America's position in the society of nations is unavoidably that of a champion of the Declaration's freedoms. Now, after identifying the Declaration's principles as the cause around which Americans should rally in order to face the threat of fascism, Jackson was careful to emphasize the importance of preserving those principles at home. Uh, and not one to pull his punches, um, Jackson warned that, and I quote, there is at home, as well as abroad, an anti-democratic influence even more cynical and dangerous than Hitler, Mussolini, and Stalin combined. Uh, he was referring to those who think democracy is a fair weather ideal, which should guide us only in soft times. Uh, these individuals, he noted, admire the striking power and efficiency of undemocratic foes abroad. But uh, he characterized the view that the concern for security should trump democracy as having, and again his words, every base quality of fascism without either its candor or its courage. Now, in response to those who would reassert that to live by the principles of the Declaration during a time of international conflict would be to lose democracy, he counseled his listeners to remember the example of our forefathers who also heard the argument that time of external danger was no time to advance freedoms. Their answer, Jackson observed, was to give liberty uh, birth not only in the midst of a war, but in the very darkest hours of that war. Why? Because they knew, Jackson said, with that, with that, that what wins struggles are the last ounces of endurance and the reserves of power that come to the common run of men 
on fire for a cause, namely the cause of our liberty, which lifts us above material ends and anchors our efforts in timeless things. Now, the Senate confirmed Jackson's appointment to the Supreme Court one week after he gave this speech. And since Justice Jackson would rule on constitutional controversies relating to the government's efforts to win the Second World War and then the Korean War, we are in a position to learn with, with some precision what Jackson meant uh, when he said as Attorney General that we must be careful to preserve the principles of the Declaration during wartime. And I, I'm going to focus on what I believe were Jackson's two most famous and important war-related opinions, uh, beginning with his dissent in the infamous case Korematsu versus United States, which was decided in 1944. Now recall the facts of this tragic uh, case. Four months after the attack on Pearl Harbor, General John L. DeWitt promulgated Order Number 34 under the authority of Executive Order 9066 in an act of Congress, which Congress uh, passed after the fact. The order directed that after May 9, 1942, all persons of Japanese ancestry should be excluded from certain areas on the West Coast. In spite of the fact that no question was raised as to Fred Korematsu's loyalty to the United States, the Supreme Court upheld the exclusion order against Korematsu's constitutional challenge, and the vote was six to three. The exclusion order led to the forced removal from the West Coast of nearly 120,000 Japanese Americans, more than two-thirds of them native-born U.S. citizens, mind you, and their subsequent incarceration in 10 desolate concentration camps. Justice Hugo Black spoke for the majority. Uh, Korematsu, Black declared, was not excluded from the military area because of hostility to him or his race. He was excluded because we were at war with the Japanese Empire, because the military authorities feared an invasion of the West Coast and decided that the urgency of the situation demanded that all citizens of Japanese ancestry be segregated from the West Coast temporarily. The need for action was great, Black said, and time was short. In his dissent, Jackson expressed his cognizance of the rationale for the government's action. The armed services must protect a society, he conceded, not merely its constitution, and defense measures will not and often should not be held within the limits that bind civil authority in peace. But Jackson declared that if we cannot confine military expedience by the constitution, neither should we distort the constitution to approve all that the military may deem expedient. In this case, in which uh, punishment was administered in the absence of a trial, or even a claim that Korematsu was not loyal to his country, and which ran contrary to the fundament fundamental American assumption that guilt is personal and not inheritable, Jackson saw an egregious violation of the Due Process Clause of the Fifth Amendment. Now, while this case demonstrated that in the very nature of things, military decisions are not susceptible of intelligent judicial appraisal, after all, Jackson said, information in support of an order could not be disclosed to courts without danger that it would reach the enemy. Um, in spite of that, it also revealed the folly of judicial legitimization of such decisions. The court, having no real evidence before it, Jackson said, is given no choice but to accept General DeWitt's own unsworn, self-serving statement untested by any cross-examination that what he did was reasonable. And thus it will always be, Jackson said, when courts try to look into the reasonableness of a military order. Jackson declared that a judicial construction of due process, uh, the due process clause, that will sustain this order is a far more subtle blow to liberty than the promulgation of the order itself. In one of the more uh, celebrated passages from his dissent, Jackson explained, a military order, however unconstitutional, is not apt to last longer than the military emergency. But once a judicial opinion rationalizes the Constitution to show that the Constitution sanctions such an order, the court for all time has validated the principle of racial discrimination in criminal procedure and of transplanting American citizens. The principle then lies about like a loaded weapon ready for the hand of any authority that can bring forward a plausible claim of an urgent need. Because the court could not know whether the relocation order had a reasonable basis and necessity, Jackson declined to suggest that the court should have attempted to interfere with the Army in carrying out its task. However, 
He believed firmly that the courts must apply only law and must abide by the Constitution, lest they become instruments of military policy. Since the courts could, uh, should not be asked to execute a military expedient that has no place under the Constitution, Jackson concluded that he would reverse the judgment and discharge the prisoner. Um, if Korematsu illuminated Jackson's position on the importance of protecting individual rights during wartime, his concurrence in Youngstown Sheet and Tube Company versus Sawyer, again decided in 1952, illuminated well his belief in the need to preserve constitutional limitations on executive power when the nation is at war. Recall the facts of Youngstown. To avert a nationwide strike of steel workers during the Korean War, President Truman issued an executive order directing the Secretary of Commerce to seize and operate most of the nation's steel mills. Uh, the order was not based upon any statutory authority. Indeed, most of the justices found that Truman's action contravened Congress's will. Rather, uh, the seizure was justified through reference uh, to the powers expressed and inherent vested in the President by the Constitution. By a vote of six to three, the court rejected the President's claim that he possessed constitutional authority to seize and operate the nation's steel mills. In his concurrence, as he did in his Korematsu dissent, Jackson acknowledged the government's rationale for the action taken. And speaking from experience, he observed that anyone who has served as legal advisor to a president in time of transition and public anxiety will understand that comprehensive, undefined presidential powers hold certain practical advantages. At the same time, however, he warned that undefined presidential powers also present grave dangers for the country. Now, after identifying three statutory policies inconsistent with Truman's action, Jackson examined systematically the various constitutional arguments that Truman advanced in support of the steel mill seizure. He began his analysis by stating that he was not persuaded that history leaves it open to question that the executive branch, like the federal government as a whole, possesses only delegated powers. After all, Jackson said, uh, the, the purpose of the Constitution was not only to grant power, but to keep it from getting out of hand. Jackson thus rejected the argument that the first clause in Article II, which you recall says, the executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States of America. Jackson rejected the argument that that clause constitutes a grant of all the executive powers of which the government is capable. If that were true, Jackson reasoned, he, it's difficult to see why the forefathers bothered to add several specific items including some trifling ones. Uh, what is more, the example of such unlimited executive power that must have most impressed the forefathers was the prerogative exercised by George III, and description of its evils in the Declaration of Independence led Jackson to doubt that they were creating their new executive in his image. Jackson uh, next rejected the argument that the President's power as Commander-in-Chief permitted him uh, to seize the steel mills. And he noted that this loose appellation of commander-in-chief is sometimes advanced as support for any presidential action, internal or external, involving use of force. The idea being uh, that it vests power to do anything anywhere that can be done with an army or a navy. Uh, but Jackson declared that no doctrine that the court could promulgate would seem to him more sinister and alarming than that a president whose conduct of foreign affairs is so largely uncontrolled and often even as unknown, can vastly enlarge his mastery over the internal affairs of the country by his own commitment of the nation's armed forces to some foreign venture. Jackson conceded that he would indulge the widest latitude of interpretation to sustain the president's exclusive function to command the instruments of national force, at least when turned against the outside world. However, he believed that the president's command power, when it's turned inward, is not such an absolute as might be implied from that office in a militaristic system, but is subject to limitations consistent with a constitutional republic whose law and policymaking branch is a representative Congress. Jackson intoned, no penance would ever expiate the sin against free government of holding that a president can escape control of executive powers by law through assuming his military role. Jackson found most disturbing 
the claim that the President possesses nebulous inherent powers never expressly granted, but which enable him to deal with a crisis or an emergency according to the necessities of the case, the unarticulated assumption being that necessity knows no law. The appeal that the Court declare the existence of inherent powers ex necessitate to meet an emergency, he said, asks us to do what many think would be wise, although it's something the forefathers omitted. By way of explanation, Jackson suggested that the framers knew what emergencies were, knew the pressures they engender for authoritative action, knew too how they afford a ready pretext for usurpation. We may also suspect, he said, that they suspected that emergency powers would tend to kindle emergencies. In his working papers for the case, Jackson was even more candid in his assessment of the concept of inherent powers. Uh, not only did he remark that a doctrine that the President has all of the powers that are imaginable, unless they're taken away from him by some constitutional provision, turns the framers' theory of delegated powers bottom side up. He also dared to link the concept of inherent powers with a particular brand of politics. This is why I love Jackson. He never pulled his punches. Quote, no government, except those of the communist or fascist dictators, is based on that doctrine, the teaching of which is as subversive of the principles of American government as any doctrine for which communists are in jail. Toward the end of his final opinion, Jackson stated that nothing in his experience convinced him that the risks associated with lodging emergency powers in the executive are warranted by any real necessity, although such powers would, of course, be an executive convenience. The essence of our free government, he said, is to be governed by those impersonal forces which we call law. With all its defects, delays, and inconveniences, men have discovered no technique for long preserving free government except that the executive be under the law and that the law be made by parliamentary deliberations. And to those who would disagree with his risk assessment and charge him with jeopardizing national security, Jackson answered, such institutions may be destined to pass away, but it's the duty of the court to be the last, not first, to give them up. At this point, it's appropriate to take stock of the implications of Jackson's opinions. Uh, to deter that is to determine what light they shine on his admonition as Attorney General, uh, that we must be careful not to abandon the principles of the Declaration in a misguided quest to shore up our defenses against our wartime enemies. In Jackson's Korematsu dissent, I would argue, we are advised to harbor a strong distrust of governmental claims that necessity requires the suspension of constitutionally uh, protected rights, specifically the right of an individual to due process of law prior to being deprived of liberty. And in his Youngstown concurrence, we are informed that even threats to national security during war do not warrant the abandonment of the notion of delegated powers and of limited executive authority. What we have, in short, is the rejection of the Bush administration's claim that a person loses his or her constitutional right to due process when the president declares that person an enemy combatant. But we also have the rejection of the argument put forth by certain Justice Department lawyers, if not the White House, that necessity during war liberates the president from the obligation to obey domestic or international laws against torture. Now, before I continue, I must anticipate and address an objection that students of Jackson's constitutional jurisprudence might raise. One might observe that Korematsu was rendered before Jackson served as United States Chief of Counsel at the Nuremberg War Crimes Trials. Jackson's exposure to the Nazi defendants and his analysis of the destruction of the Weimar Republic, the argument might run, convinced him of the naivete of his earlier uh, beliefs. And as evidence of Jackson's jurisprudential shift, alleged jurisprudential shift, one can refer to his opinion for the court in uh, Johnson versus Eisentrager, which was decided in 1950. In that case, Jackson said that the Due Process Clause cannot be understood to give the same rights to all persons that it gives to American citizens. 
and that the right it bestows on detained aliens depend on a variety of facts, including whether the alien is detained in the United States, whether he's ever been in the United States, and in particular, whether he is a citizen of an enemy nation. Now, how do I respond? Um, I would argue that this opinion, the Eisentrager decision, must be reconciled with another post-Nuremberg opinion, namely Jackson's dissent in Shaughnessy versus Mazai, which was decided in 1952. There, the court sustained the Attorney General's order, based ostensibly on national security grounds, to exclude an alien without a hearing. Jackson dissents. In his dissent, Jackson noted that the communist conspiratorial techniques of infiltration tempt government to confine suspects, suspects on secret information secretly judged. And he conceded that he was not one to discount the communist threat. But my apprehensions about the security of our form of government, he said, are about equally aroused by those who will not see the danger in anything else. Here, the government's detention of Mazai had, and again, Jackson's words, unmistakable tones of the Nazis' practice of protective custody, against which the arrested could claim no judicial or other hearing. And just as Nazi concentration camps have been populated with victims of summary executive detention for secret reasons, this practice, once established with the best of intentions, would drift into oppression of the disadvantaged in this country as it has elsewhere. In Jackson's view, procedural fairness and regularity are of the indispensable essence of liberty. And the most scrupulous observance of due process, including the right to know a charge, to be confronted with the accusers, to cross-examine informers, and to produce evidence in one's behalf is especially necessary where the occasion of detention is fear of future misconduct rather than crimes committed. And in his draft opinion, Jackson stated even more passionately his belief in the importance of procedural justice. Again, uh, Jackson's words. This is what's great about writing a talk about Jackson is all I have to do is read him, uh, and I sound articulate. Um, Jackson said, the simplicity of my origins and the mediocrity of my attainments leaves me still believing that something in the mysterious order of the universe gives a man, just because he's a human being, certain dignities and personal immunities which no man and no government can trample or invade without setting in motion forces of retribution. I have seen it, and may God have mercy on this country if ever our people cease to believe it. It appears then that even after Nuremberg, Jackson would not have countenanced the denial of due process to American citizens when the president identifies them as enemy combatants. And what is more, I think Jackson would have thought aliens deserving of due process if detained in this country even if the president were to identify them as enemy combatants. And I also think it's unlikely that he would have uh, regarded places geographically outside of the United States, but under US sovereignty, for example, Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, as places where aliens were undeserving of due process. Uh, my point is this. Nuremberg certainly affected Jackson's thought, but scholars often overlook the fact that it strongly reinforced his belief in the importance of due process. Now, unlike the Korematsu decision, Youngstown occurred after Nuremberg, so one cannot argue that Jackson's insistence that the executive adhere to the rule of law was the reflection of a naive political philosophy that lasted only until the harsh lessons of Nuremberg uh, re revealed its limitations. One might argue, however, uh, that Jackson did distinguish in his Youngstown concurrence between executive action directed against the outside world from that turned inward. However, I would argue that one would be hard pressed to argue that Jackson, especially after Nuremberg, would in any way have supported claims that presidential power is not bound by domestic or international laws prohibiting torture. In fact, the whole point of the Nuremberg trials, in Jackson's view, was to hold leaders accountable for violating international law and custom. Jackson went uh, even further and argued successfully that the Nazis should be punished for crimes against humanity, even though that charge had not even a pseudo legal basis. I hope it's apparent that reference to Jackson's rulings on executive power uh, does not serve only as a critique of the current administration, 
or of Republican presidents generally. Recall that Jackson's opinions in Korematsu and Youngstown, and Shaughnessy versus Mazai for, uh, for that matter, were directed at Democratic administrations. Jackson understood that no party has a monopoly on the misuse of power. I would also note that Jackson's commitment to the preservation of individual rights and limitations on executive power during wartime was anything but radical or revolutionary, unless uh, one uses the term revolutionary in its literal sense. For I would like to conclude my presentation uh, by emphasizing briefly the connection between Jackson's distrust of executive power during war and the political teachings of a member of the revolutionary generation whose patriotism was unimpeachable, James Madison, uh, who was rightly regarded as the father of the Constitution. Jackson's frequent references to the founding generation and his writings and opinions on executive power during wartime were not gratuitous. For like Jackson, Madison, and Thomas Jefferson for that matter, uh, were very concerned with executive aggrandizement, of which Madison said, war is in fact the true nurse. War requires the creation of physical force, and it gives the executive the direction of it. War also unlocks the public treasury, and it's the executive which distributes its bounties. War, Madison observed, thus plays to the strongest passions and the most dangerous weaknesses of the human breast, ambition, avarice, vanity, and the honorable or venial love of fame. Because all of these passions are gratified by war more than by the administration of domestic affairs, they are in conspiracy against the, uh, the desire and the duty of peace. Madison regarded the natural attraction of the executive to war as particularly worrisome. Why? Because the executive's efforts to wage successful war are purchased at the expense of accountability to the electorate and adherence to the terms of a written constitution. In short, executive aggrandizement during war threatens to destroy our liberty. As Madison said, in time of actual war, great discretionary powers are constantly given to the executive magistrate. The means of defense against foreign danger have always been the instruments of tyranny at home. And again, the fetters imposed on liberty at home have ever been forged out of the weapons provided for defense against real, pretended, or imaginary dangers from abroad. So strong is the propensity for war in the executive, Madison thought, that that branch would be tempted to use force in situations that did not warrant such a muscular response. And so strong is the desire to prevail in war that even if the decision to go to war is warranted, the executive would be tempted to call for the curtailment of liberty and the suspension of constitutional limitations on power when such measures were, in fact, unnecessary. To use Madison's words, of all the trust committed to a government, the management of foreign relations appears to be the most susceptible of abuse. For in war, the reasons for executive action can be concealed or disclosed or disclosed in such parts and at such times, as will best suit particular views. To avoid the loss of liberty that accompanies war, Madison tried unsuccessfully to secure legislation that would force each generation to pay for its sins, that is, to pay for its wars, as opposed to permitting one generation to pass those costs on to future generations. Now, in spite of his failure in this regard, Madison believed that the Constitution actually did much to reduce the incentives for war by lodging the decision whether to make war, not in the executive, but in the branch closest to the individuals who would be required to fight the campaigns. <clears throat> However, Madison believed that changes in the constitutional distribution of power can occur during war, regardless of constitutional forms, so long as these changes are met with the approval of public opinion or are allowed to happen because of either the indifference of public opinion or its silence because of a muzzled or a supine press. Madison thus believed that the ultimate defense against the abuse of executive power during war is for citizens to be the guardians of their own constitution. <clears throat> 
And Madison regarded as one of the most sacred duties of a free people, the responsibility to be cognizant of the executive's propensity to go to war for reasons that do not coincide with the national interest, and to conduct war in a manner that is unnecessarily restrictive of individual rights. Which brings us back to Robert Jackson. Jackson made a point of concluding his Korematsu dissent and his Youngstown concurrence with a warning. In Youngstown, after explaining his reasons for ruling against Truman's seizure of the steel mills, Jackson intoned, I cannot be brought to believe that this country will suffer if the court refuses further to aggrandize the a presidential office already so potent and so relatively immune from judicial review at the expense of Congress. But I have no illusion that any decision by this court can keep power in the hands of Congress if it is not wisely and, uh, wise and timely in meeting its problems. And after dissenting from the court's decision to sustain the relocation of Japanese Californians, Jackson said, but I would not lead people to rely on this court for a review that seems to me wholly delusive. If the people ever let command of the war power fall into irresponsible uns and unscrupulous hands, the courts wield no power equal to its restraint. So, while Jackson believed that the principles of the Declaration of Limited Government are certainly worth fighting for, he also believed that the pursuit of success in war does not warrant the abandonment of those principles during the conflict. To return to the words of Attorney General Jackson, we Americans cannot cease to be the kind of people we are. We cannot cease to live the kind of life we live. In an effort to encourage vigilance in the face of arguments that such counsel during war threatens our very uh, way of life, Jackson declared, echoing Madison, let us in America never forget that liberties trampled by conquest may be regained. But liberties abandoned by an indifferent people are never recovered, nor are they deserved. Thank you. clock a little bit because we have to get Jeff on an airplane out of here fairly soon. So uh, uh, we do have time for a few questions. So uh, Raleigh, you'll let me know when we got to cut this off because he's, he's going to be the driver. 15 minutes, okay. Ken. In other words, would Jackson see a difference of opinion? Yeah, so. yeah um, because the Youngstown decision came with the Korean War, so which was an undeclared conflict. Korematsu came during the Second World War, which was a declared war. Um, I would argue that Jackson was rigorously consistent in being distrustful of executive power, whether the war was declared or undeclared. Having said that, and being um, uh, trying to follow uh, or to practice what I preach with my students, uh, I like to look critically upon the argument that I make to see if it holds water. And if you really wanted to give me problems, what you would say is, well, what about ex parte querying, which you have not mentioned? This is the case in which um, you had uh, uh, German nationals who came uh, onto the shores of uh, this country, were captured, and they were here to, uh, uh, to blow up uh, military uh, installments or, or to just wreak havoc upon our our uh, economy. Um, and in that case, um, the, the uh, court ended up, and Jackson was part of the majority, and what he said, uh, what the court said was that um, the military trials that were established for these individuals are constitutional. Um, and so how does this uh, reflect upon the argument that I made? Well, I don't think that it, um, that it ruins uh, my argument. Uh, what I would say is this. Um, in that case, they, they made um, uh, a, a point of saying that we are in a declared war here. 
right? And what we're talking about in this situation is not a total denial of due process, right? which is what I was talking about in my uh, main presentation. Um, so what you could say about Jackson's position in ex parte querent is that at, at most what it suggests is during a declared war, um, Jackson would see fit to allow the executive to have establish military tribunals for foreign nationals. Um, but I would say this, this exists in some tension with the opinions that I talked about, in particular Shaughnessy versus Mazai, which occurred after ex parte Quirin, I believe, um, or in, this, uh, in the same year perhaps. Um, and there you have uh, an incredible amount of uh, rhetoric, uh, deeply felt, you can tell, that uh, we must take seriously our commitment to due process. So even though Jackson in ex parte Quirin is willing to tolerate military tribunals as opposed to the normal judicial process during a declared war, I would argue that Jackson in no way would have allowed a military trial like that to become a pretext for just uh, convicting these people. That he was serious that if they were going to use military tribunals, that they would have to be uh, uh, fair. Any other questions? Up there? Yes, yeah, sure. Good thing I got that out of the way, then. <laughs> well, but, but I do have a sort of a, a tag on that. Wouldn't the Bush administration say that, that their activities today are more similar to the Nazi saboteurs case than to the pro Nazi case? Well, yeah, if you think about that, though, what does that mean? At most, if you're going to use Jackson to make your argument, what you would be able to say is this, that if you look at ex parte Quirin, Jackson seems that he would be willing to allow military trials of these sorts of individuals, which is what, I forget which justice or justices intimated as much in these three cases that were decided that were handed down during the summer. Okay, um, so, but that's very different from the claim that uh, the Bush administration was making uh, initially, which was they have no right whatever to due process. Uh, I think I can say very confidently that, ja that you can't use Jackson to support that uh, claim. Jackson, I, I think, uh, before after, during Nuremberg, was adamant that there has to, that due process must be accorded. And again, even if uh, um, we're to allow military trials, I suspect Jackson, uh, and this is what's, uh, I, I cheat, I get to cheat on these things. This is what Jackson would have said, you know, we, we don't really know, but I have to believe, given what he did say, that Jackson would have insisted on, um, uh, that the governments uh, uh, be incredibly fair in the way they deal with uh, with these accused individuals. Yeah. Kevin? Well, my other case is uh, how, how, would, how might you respond to that case? How might this fit into your analysis? Or, I mean, there you have congressional authority, so there's more. Yeah, there we're in a different area of uh, jurisprudence. This is First Amendment. Right. And I would argue, um, here I'm here to celebrate Jackson, but I believe that Celebrating someone is, uh, uh, to, to celebrate someone does not mean that you don't look at their foibles. And I would argue that Jackson's uh, position in the Dennis case was not one of his uh, uh, shining moments as a justice. I think that in that case, not just Jackson, but a majority of the justices, there was actually only a plurality opinion in that case, but a, a majority of the justices were not sufficiently respectful uh, of the First Amendment there. So, um, yeah, when we move to the First Amendment, Jackson's a much more complicated individual. I don't regard, uh, I don't accept the argument of my mentor, Henry Abraham, uh, that Jackson became this, uh, in, this raging conservative after coming back from Nuremberg and that he was a libertarian activist uh, before going to Nuremberg. I think Jackson all along was a much more complicated justice on the issue of the First Amendment. He never was a libertarian judicial activist to begin with. Uh, nor was he ever a raging conservative, even on, on First Amendment issues after that. But if you do look at the Dennis opinion, I mean, he was very willing uh, to allow the silencing of, uh, of radical speech in that case. Um, but again, um, it, you know, it, 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 at least what he would insist on is, is uh, scrupulous uh, adherence to due process uh, before we imprison these people for what they said, which is not much consolation if you believe in a strong notion uh, of free speech.
you know, I've been listening to you saying what would Jackson do, or thinks that we ought to have a marketing piece in those little bracelets, WWJD. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> don't, don't. Bad. Bad. I'd like to thank the Jamestown Savings Bank and the folks from Heritage, a public abstract company, should Jamestown Community College. Uh, Jeff spoke earlier today down at the President's Roundtable at Jamestown Community College, and the comment by President DeSincu holds today, where we've been privileged to have a really high-level professor come and talk to us like students at a class. And these folks at Allegheny College here hopefully have taken copious notes. Thanks for coming. Yeah. And you've been, this, this uh, you have not only Professor Setting, Professor McMahon up there, you, you've got a lot of talent out here who's been uh, watching you. So uh, wonderful job, well done. And on behalf of the Jackson, thank, you, to everybody thank for you very much for coming.